I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. If you would bow with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you so thankful for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. We thank you for this county, this the cities that we live in, and, and we thank you for this hospital. We ask you, Father, that uh, you would be with us tonight as we review the needs of the hospital and make decisions and guide us to make wise decisions, Father. We do ask you also, Father, to be with us as we face down this coronavirus. Strengthen us, be with us always. Help us defeat this. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's start out with a roll call. So, Layhouse, here. Grace Jonas, absent. Jeff Jordan, present. Sam Carter, Kristen Cook, absent. Allison Lambert, present. Larry Richardson, here. And Tom Miller is present. All right. <coughs> Next up on the agenda is the approval of the February 20th, 2020 board meeting minutes. If you would take a look at those. Yes. make a motion for the approval of the February, I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, the February 20th, 2020 board minutes, meeting minutes. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Allison Lambeth, second by Sam Carter, to approve the February 2020, uh, excuse me, what is it? February 20th, 2020. February 20th, 2020. Uh, minutes. <laughs> All in favor? Motion carries. Sorry, I've got to have this. All right. Next up on the agenda is citizen input. We have no citizen input this evening, so we'll move on to item number six. For you to consider and take action regarding the following issues. Uh, first is A, Board of Directors business and the acceptance of Grace Perez's resignation letter. Uh, as I mentioned before, we received a letter from, or an email from Grace that says, it is with deep regret that I will not be able to run to keep my seat on the Board of Directors. I am recuperating well, continuing with rehab here at home, but I still have a long way to go. According to the therapist, rehab is going well, but the stroke did affect my right side a great deal and I may need additional therapy, but that's okay. I have a positive attitude throughout the entire process. Everyone's good thoughts and prayers have also helped. Thank you for the opportunity for being able to serve my community. I hope that in the near future I can run again. I wish you all well. So that's 
So what we need to do at this point is uh, is have a motion to accept Grace's resignation letter. I'll make a motion we accept Grace's Grace Perez's resignation letter. Okay. No, second. Motion by Jeff Jordan. Uh, second by Larry Richardson to accept <coughs> Grace Perez's resignation letter. All in favor? Sure. Motion carries. We do appreciate Grace's service very much and we'll miss her. I'd just like to also mention that at this time, Precinct 2 is uh, unrepresented on the board. So if anybody knows of anyone that might live in that precinct that might not serve. Uh, Where is it? That's uh, on around 97, back towards Poth, because she's still not Okay. Yeah. I might be able to find somewhere. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird? Yeah. I'll double check that. I have a map. I think I'll, I'll double check. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, B, May 2nd, 2020 <coughs> general election uh, for the Wilson County Memorial Hospital District Board of Directors. Uh, we have no opposition in this election. Uh, so we have asked to. Uh, I don't know if I need a motion for this, or I just uh, need we'll to do a motion it. official. Okay. Mm -hmm. We talked to the lawyer. These okay. are three steps we <coughs> need to take action on. Okay. So we do have uh, three that are up. Precinct 1, Marcelo Lighthouse. Precinct 3, Jeff Jordan. Precinct 4, Sam Carter. None of which are opposed. Uh, Precinct 2, we do not have candidates for. No applications were filed for that position. So at this point, we're, we need to uh, approve of, of that uh, acceptance of the certification of unopposed candidates. May I have a motion? So moved. Okay. Second. Motion by Allison Lambeth. Uh, excuse me. Second by uh, Larry, Larry Richardson. Excuse me. Uh, all in favor? Okay. Motion carries. Uh, next up is the approval of the order of cancellation for the May 2nd, 2020 election. There's more than that, but... I move that we uh, approve the order of cancellation for the May 2nd, 2020 regular election. Second. <clears throat> I have a motion by Larry Richardson, uh, second by Jeff Jordan, to approve the cancellation, the order of cancellation for... Uh, the May 2nd, 2020 election. All in favor? Okay, motion carries. Um, okay, the, the next item, number three, is a little confusing to me. I'm not sure what, why do we need to canvass the election if we're not having an election? I had the same question, and the lawyer said that that was one of those, the last ones we should have someone just come officially meet, have a few snacks, and have the appoint uh, two board members to meet on May 5th at 8.30, Conley, to canvass the May that. 2nd election. We did, didn't we do that? Mm -hmm. I think Larry and I did it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, question the same thing, but it's an official thing that we have to do, just to cross all the T's and dot all the I's. Same thing, right? What is that date? May 5th. I mean, what day is it? May 5th. May 5th. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I will volunteer to do the board members if I have to travel with us. It's a Tuesday. It's a Tuesday, yeah. I'll be, I'll be happy to do it too if you want me. All right. Unless somebody else would and like we to. Will. Fine. Point to Allison Lambeth and Larry Richardson as the permanent canvassers from Peter. <laughs> 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 we're really, really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think we need uh, hard <laughs> that. Hard to do. No, just on your point. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Larry, Larry Richardson, sure. and Allison Lambeth will be uh, our appointees to canvass on May fifth. The meeting May fifth at eight thirty a.m. Uh, to uh, I didn't see that part. Yeah. Man. <laughs> You get up there early and we're <laughs> yeah, Okay. Uh, all right. So we appreciate your your willingness to volunteer for that. Uh, next up, item seven. <coughs> we're going to consider and take action regarding any of the following issues. Uh, first up is the February summary and financial analysis. Everyone present in this room was present for that. Do we need them to go through it again, or can we just go ahead and take the recommendation? And go slower. <laughs> 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 I 
I'm good with not going through it again unless so what, what was you just feel compelled to reiterate the numbers. The okay. Finance Committee recommends the approval of the February summary and financial analysis as presented. I make a motion. Motion by Marcel Lighthouse. Second. Second. Second by Jeff Jordan to accept the February summary and financial analysis. All in favor? Uh, next up is appoint individuals to the River Bend Community Development Corporation. Where you did this? Y'all uh, had, mm? had loosely uh, talked about it myself when we talked about it, but we didn't have an official vote. And I think there, we, uh, we, we've discussed this. Um, I think we had some volunteers. Allison said that uh, uh, she, she would. We never did an official vote. Right. And I think we have an opportunity. Uh, and it, it I am. Need to be official. Yes, it needs to be official, and I would ask that we have a representative because I think it's important. I do have a lot going on right now, and I don't think I would give it to complete justice. I would be amicable to being a alternate so that I could go now and then just to understand their role and what they're doing um, and how it affects the hospital. But I think it might be good to appoint a person of the community to do such a job. All right. At the time, if I remember, it was like really disorganized. Or and they're working towards the, from what I've heard, and, and uh, there is some things that need to be um, addressed. addressed. Thank you. We're You're looking welcome. for the correct word. Well, and, um, excuse me. I'm kind of aware of this, and I, and I met with Henrietta, or I didn't meet with her. I ran into her at HEB yesterday, and they, they cannot move forward on their. Um, I don't want to say investigation, that's kind of harsh, but, you know, looking in inquiry. to see inquiry in, into this matter, and it needs to be looked into, but they have to all, every, every entity has to be represented. Yes. And we are a tax recipient in Wilson County, so we have to have someone to represent us. <clears throat> But you seem to be the expert on the board in this matter. Would you like to represent us? I would like my husband to represent. I recommend that my husband rep uh, represent Conway Memorial if that's favorable for Dahl. He's, he seems to know all the parties and he works well with all the other representatives. And uh, I think he would do justice um, and serve to the benefit of, our, of the hospital district. So it doesn't have to be a board member. It does not have to be a board member. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. The previous well, was uh, appointed to. Up yeah, up. It's, they're just appointed, mm -hmm. you know. But it's in the interest of the hospital. Mm -hmm. Is Ray Yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and we should probably have them come report to us and let us know. We did yeah. not have the reporting back on the board that we probably closed the move. Mm -hmm. okay. And he'd be more than willing to, you know, just in time to put him on the agenda. Or you want to make a motion or you prefer someone else? I think somebody else needs to. And I can leave if y'all want to discuss it. I'll be happy to leave. I move that we appoint Ray Lambert to fill this position on behalf of the hospital. Second. Okay. Okay. A motion by Larry Richardson, second by Michelle Lighthouse to appoint Ray Lambert to represent the hospital on the Little Bend Community Development Corporation. All in favor? Michelle carries. No, 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 you have to give recuse from the vote yourself. Uh, oh. For the record, I'm recusing myself for uh, from the vote. Okay. <clears throat> All in, everyone was in favor except for Alison Lambert, who doesn't like her husband that much. No. She <laughs> <laughs> recused herself. She's on the day. You should be All right, uh, moving forward, we will move on to annual and quarterly board reports. Are they waiting outside for us, or are you going to? I'm going to give some of them. I'm the only one. I'm, the infection control report. I'm going to allow uh, the group to come in. I think it's important at that time. Okay. So um, we're going to call center. Call center report. So um, I want to thank each of the board members personally for giving me a call when they know that there's an issue. Uh, please reach out to me whenever you know if there's a problem. And I've heard from y'all that the call center was experiencing some difficulties. People weren't able to get through in a timely manner. Uh, we did notice that uh, some of the engineering behind the engineers who programmed the phone system had found some quality issues. Uh, they were able to determine it. We actually could get down. We tracked through uh, literally uh, the person's phone number and the time they called. We actually got a picture of what time they called, and we were able to track on reports why some of the disconnections weren't happening or were happening. 
uh, with phone calls. It wasn't that our staff weren't able to uh, handle the calls. We have the staffing there. We have five people and they should be able to handle it in a very timely manner without being, people being in a queue for very long. And so uh, we corrected this this last month and uh, even with January's and February numbers being uh, having that difficulty, uh, that programming issue, um, we were sitting, let me, I should probably do the other slide before this. Uh, January and February, we were, we were dipping down to the 60 and 70 percent uh, call rate, answer rate, um, and uh, without them hanging up or being on hold too long. Uh, we have now increased in this last quarter up to 88 percent of our calls answered. The interesting thing is that's even though, you know, it's a different time right now, and they're getting a lot of questions and a lot of calls, and, and uh, primary care is a big need in the community uh, with the uh, departure and uh, uh, retirement of several individuals. And so um, there were experiencing, last year we were reporting numbers in the 400s and low 500s of calls per day. Um, right now we are still experiencing up, upwards of 600 calls, 612 calls a day, Monday through Friday. And Fridays a day? for a day. Okay. 612 calls a day. A That's day. 125 calls roughly per person that they yeah. have mm -hmm. answering those phones. This is, this is, and so I want to reiterate, this is why we need a call center. If you have those calls going along, so if you talk to a physician um, who's been here for a while, and they had those calls coming into their, um, into their practice, we were answering anywhere, if I remember the numbers correctly, it was 37% to 43% of the calls were being answered on a daily basis. And so right now we're at 88%, but including those numbers are uh, before we found the fault in our phone system. Remember in the very early part of last year, we were at 98%, 99%. So we expect to get back there. We are in a different time right now too with people calling. They have questions on coronavirus. They have questions on scheduling of their appointments, if they can delay them. or Some people are not, uh, they're deferring, they're listening to other president, Mark, president of the United States saying, <coughs> don't get out if you don't have to. So we are experiencing high call volumes right now. That's just I can't wrap my brain around. That's why I've been call center with as many calls as we get a day. This is this is very important that we have that central line. And the specialists are still giving their own calls. Are they, are they going to the call center? They're answering, so I'm going to go back to that. They're answering about 35% of their calls and they're getting directed to the call center. Right. Okay. Because we did reprogram it to where all overflow goes to the call center. Goes to the call center. And they, the, the thing is, is that the, where I hear the most, um, you know, negativity sure. is from the elderly because mm -hmm. they can't get in and talk to someone and they're not used to that. Their whole life they've been able to talk to a nurse. And if we could just let everybody know that, our, and I know you were considering putting an RN on the call center. Y'all talked about that. Yeah, that was actually um, up until last month. I was I was looking at heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. I'll talk a little bit more. Okay. Mm -hmm. And anyway, but they just they don't understand the the computer no. and and it you know in the automated system. So yeah. So it's just you know I'm trying to teach all the ones that I I know that have voiced their concerns to me. And I just well, think I have we need one to reach out. It works. Way. Yeah. But he wants to speak to somebody that's familiar and not with him. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's tough. But I will get there one day. I, I have former board members that come talk to me. I have people that they want to talk to somebody. They they cherish that relationship, and I, I completely understand that. But trying to meet the needs of the community <clears throat> and, and the number of calls and the number of people that need a position, uh, this is the best way I mm -hmm. believe. And y'all can push back on me, but I believe this is the best way we can do it to meet the needs. You know, the primary cares are so busy. Yeah. And at this point, I don't think that we have nothing to compare it to to see if this is even, if it doesn't work. It's obviously it's working if we're hitting that many and our percentages are high, but what's your other option? Go back to 37%. So, have they rather. I don't think people remember in the early days when we just had one primary care physician and and all the calls were routed through there, and they're trying to mm -hmm. take care of patients and trying to answer calls. I, I, I do remember those days, and that was, we developed, I remember 
my old friend Tom Rapino, he was like, I've got to have a centralized way of answering calls so the physician can see patients. And uh, I know the big systems who handle multiple physicians, Gonzaba in San Antonio, WellMed right next door, they have these call centers and it is frustrating for um, the retired, mm -hmm. the elderly, if you will, and um, it, it is a different way of communication and it is, it is something they don't, they don't cherish, but if we can help them, I think it is to it's get like there. It's like anything else, change, elderly are set in their ways and don't want to change. So, it's about helping them understand the change. And I had rather see them get somebody, even if they don't know them on the phone, up to them getting frustrated about calling back. Because they hang up. So, um, I didn't include. That's what they do. They don't listen to their care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I, I can tell you, you know, when I worked in the newspaper business, our call center was in the Philippines. Yeah. And, you know, it went, if you have anything other than I just didn't get my paper, you know, anything complex at all, it was difficult. There was a language barrier, you know. And uh, but they, our people are here, and they, they're part of the community. They care about the community, and I, and I think that's good. Um, you know, and system. System. So yeah, and also we, we you look at it as you know how it used to be. Well, you know our, our I can't remember what our population growth has been, but our population growth has gone up like this, and the number of primary care physicians has come down. So we have more people per physician now. I mean. They never there's not enough mm -hmm. positions now, so there's a, there's no way that the calls can go directly to their office and have them function. That the call centers, the, the only way. Are, are we going to change the specialists? Yeah. All new specialists coming in are required to go to the call center, I, I, and I, then I, I have a plan in moving that direction with each specialist. And Dr. Uh, Propena has agreed to be the first to go in and then we'll show them how well we handle his calls, and then we'll move to cardiology, and then we'll move to ENT. We actually have a game plan on moving each one into the call center, because what makes it confusing for people is having 20 different numbers to call. If you have one number you can call, and yes, you have to push one for primary care, and two for specialty, and then pick your one, and then you're in. And if we can answer, so before this issue that we had, I was watching it. So I get a much more detailed report, and we were at, in peak times, up to 27 minutes before we'd answer your call. And that was too long. So that's when it delved into finding out what the answer is. We are now at 17 seconds on average that we answer your call. So that is the key, is having enough personnel, enough <coughs> management of time and personnel to answer that call in a timely manner so people don't get frustrated. And that's on me. And so we've worked on that. And so uh, I apologize for all the calls you may have received in the last 90 days, but I've heard and we've made direct action. The team, I haven't done it, the team has gotten into it. Uh, Brandon and Olivia really dived into this, really worked with uh, programmers and engineers, and they've, they've solved this issue. And so hats off to them for doing this. What is the uh, objection, I guess? Or some of specialties not to have to go to the call center, not for, for So the, the, the big one I've heard, in all honesty, uh, when I've had actually people come to my office talk to me, uh, one of them was someone I knew well in the community, and um, they said, Bob, I miss the personal relationship I have with my physician. I think that is the number one. I can pick up the phone, I can call, and I can talk to my physician at no, but any that, time. That's the, that's the patient, but what about the doctor? What's oh. their objection? Uh, and let me tell you why I say that. I called in. Uh, Dr. Henley says it's time for your colonoscopy, so called Dr. Assam's office. So I called the 1400 number. Right. Okay. How can we help you? They were very pleasant. I uh, said I need to schedule an appointment with Dr. Assam. Okay, hang on. Hello, can we help you? What can we do for you? I need to schedule an appointment with Dr. Assam. Hang on. You know, two minutes later, hello, this is, you know, can we help you? I need to schedule a <laughs> with Dr. Zahn. Okay, uh, we will have him call you back. Okay. Yeah. Four days later, I got a call. And, and uh, the, I just don't think that's that's not good. And that's where the frustration is. Yeah. And so two things we've done to that. Number one, um, the, uh, you're absolutely right. In fact, that is a frustration, and that would frustrate me just as well. And so I look at that, you know, would that frustrate me too as well? Well, it, the thing is, is that our people would, it, it, if you get transferred up, you call Dr. Son's office and you get transferred up to the call center. We immediately 
take your name and number. Before we'd always try to reroute you back. That's what they were trying to do, reroute. And so you then you get back. rerouted, you get rerouted <coughs> to a different person in the call center because it's the next person, and then it would just round and round. We just put a stop to that, and the process ends um, once we know that that person gets transferred right back up. We take a name and number, and then we try to look at it. The ideal situation is to get Hassan into the call center where they can schedule, and they the, the doctors can build their templates as they want. So the real honesty is that they uh, like to have, um, they have a template and they like the flexibility. And they can control that with their staff as the flexibility. The call center's in a different location, different place, and just communicating, with, coming out of your office and saying, I want to flex and do this on this certain time or day. You know, it's early Fridays. It's, it's, <clears throat> but it's a little bit different, but the, the goal is, is, is this has been going on for a number of years. And so I am working to get that back and take control of it. So the specialist for us. The podiatrist is in the call center. No, no I'm saying <coughs> the specialist does not want to. Or in the past history, yes. They did but right now, is there? Do we have Just our specialist always yeah. work with them? Without me, even most of them are good, or they want to wait to see it, see how it works. Might be I think what I'm doing is combinations. It is going to happen. Yeah, I'm not sure that we can handle it. And if I can nip it in the bud, go at a time. I can take it, chip it away, a little bit of time, okay, that will work, rather than making it, I don't see why, and if I make a blanket statement and bring 10 of the special songs, no, that's not, I got one, I got I may not be able to work, you should be proactively looking at your schedule, coming up with a schedule plan, building in an ECW, and then training all the staff, there's nuances to every specialist. The, pedi the, pedi the pediatrician used to not be in the call center, the pediatrician is now in the call center. There were many nuances to scheduling pediatrics. You don't want to bring in... The specialists work for us, I think. Everybody may want to do No, 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 I apologize. I'm sorry. We were... We were sideboard. Well, I'm saying that... Yeah, just, I don't what about say, so the pediatrician board. used to not be in our, our call center, and there and there was good reason because there was great difficulty when you're scheduling peds patients. You can't do a uh, newborn screen and uh, a vaccine. Uh, you can't do um, up to so many days, up to sixty days. Right? There was a period of time before a patient could actually be registered with the insurance company. There was just so many nuances to scheduling. Two. Um, uh, um, Siblings at the same time cannot be scheduled. You, you, you had to plan accordingly. If it was a well, you had an earache and you're doing your annual exam with your, uh, with your child, those two can't go together. There's a lot of things that need to be trained in the call center for it to be brought on appropriately. I think at the time when we did call center six or seven years ago, it was all brought in. Everybody brought them all in at once and they didn't plan accordingly. And so what happened was the physician said, see, it'll never work. You need to bring it back to us. So now what we're doing is we've shown that we can do it with primary care. Now we'll take it, we'll work on, we've done it with uh, podiatry. We had the pediatrician come on now and we've trained accordingly and brought her on uh, here. And it's all working seamlessly and well. So now we'll bring on HBO and wound care. The urologist, when he comes on board, will be brought into that system and that'll be trained. Then we'll work on ENT, cardiology, Olivia's coming up with a plan to take each one and train and handle appropriately. And also look at our call volumes and look at our, our answer rate times and collect staff accordingly. And if we need more staff, move that. So we need to show them that we can grasp it within our call center. And that's on us to do. I just don't see your point of having two different methods. I know you're working that way, yeah. but they need to understand we can't have two different methods because if the elderly or the more frustrated population, well, you, do I call this number because it's a specialty? And, you know, muscle memory is important for them, so they have one avenue. So that's why I was asking if, if the specialists don't want it, and they, or they just don't want to relinquish the control of their schedule. But building the algorithms as we move and add, that's different. I want to say that Bob has been excellent at calling uh, people back. And, uh, I'm, always, I'm not always perfect. 
And well, sometimes I have had delays, and I can only apologize. But I, you know, I mean, getting on it in a reasonable amount of time, um, even if the answer is not what they want to hear, it's much appreciated. Goes a long ways to uh, healing wounds in the community. Mm -hmm. so, well, an answer that they don't want is better than an answer that they're not getting. Period. Right. Yeah. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Six, six, okay. I guess. That is my cross center report. Unless y'all have any other questions on that. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Did you keep them supplied with coffee? Because they're probably going to need some extra caffeine in that call center. That being called slowly slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those young ladies, I have to go over there at least once a week and tell them thank you. All right, we'll move on now to the monthly patient satisfaction report. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get that one so that we keep our room to 10. So infection control, we might go a little over, but we'll, we'll work on that. So I told you all we're going to do this monthly, and uh, I think it's very important. Um, I want to give you all a little perception here, or a little bit of information here. So our general thing is to look at inpatient rate and recommend. We have great scores uh, to look at. Uh, we have been dipping. We were always hitting in the 90s. Uh, and in the last three quarters, we have uh, not met the standard that we want to meet uh, for rate. Uh, this one, as we reported last month, was at 32%. They made some efforts over the last month, and they had reached the 39 to, um, uh, to end the quarter. Um, there are a lot of nuances to that, no excuses. Our uh, med surge manager, who was managing had to actually take shifts uh, over the last, since November. Um, she'd been working quite frequently, um, and we'd had a numerous employees that were, um, um, that were contract. Agency. Agency, thank you. Mm -hmm. Agency, and so uh, we believe now that agency has been limited, and Letty can get back to more of a management role, we should see those scores pick up, and they should work, they're working together as a team. Um, and then, the same thing, I recommend. Um, that one only crept up about three points from 28 to 31 uh, percent um, in the national ranking. And you know this one's been kind of all over the place, but this is still three consecutive quarters uh, where it's been low. Um, no excuse, um, but one thing that I did pull up was the trending for this last quarter uh, towards the end. So if you remember in our four-star rating, it's not rate and recommend. That's just a good general rule that if people will rate you high as uh, uh, recommended rate, that the other scores would be high. This one actually takes uh, overall, takes all those things that are encompassing. How does the physician treat you? How does the nurse call light come into play? Uh, do they, um, does the laboratory person who draws your blood, all those, all those categories, does the doctor come and visit you uh, and talk to you uh, in a way that you might understand? All the questions are all then lumped up into kind of an overall rating score, uh, but four star takes every one of those and weights them to get your score rating. Uh, so one positive note, two consecutive scores at 47 and 28. Um, the previous two, 76 and 72, we are at the 78th percentile ranking. Uh, but we are diving into each and every score right now. We do have a committee that is working on it, headed up by um, Manny Sarala and Valerie Vick, our quality director, and uh, they are really, and Letty being freed up, they're getting back on this and focusing on it. They will be meeting, reporting these scores to you monthly until we see that trend back up. So I'm not trying to confuse you, but I wanted you to understand rate and recommend. Those were kind of the overall scores we were looking at. They're good scores to look at to see trends, and so that enables us to focus on. Are so these scores based on the <laughs> survey return? Yes, the written set. And inpatient. What about, I mean, I, every time I do anything now, I get an electronic one. Yes. You know, so I, I guess what I'm at curious is, what's your percentage of return? Um, we got 30 out of, how many discharges did we have uh, last, do you know how many we yeah, had over a quarter? quarter? Probably had, Probably. So maybe 240. Okay. And of those 240, about 60% qualify. Okay, uh, for a survey. So um, I think the last I looked at it, uh, we were looking at less than 10%. It was somewhere with uh, 8%, I think, return rate, the That's last I looked. 
That's about the average we see around our community. I guess I always, I always wonder what the, you know, that people are often are more compelled to complain than they are to give good. You know, if they're mad, they're going to respond. Exactly. Where if they were happy, they may or may not, you know, so. I agree with you wholeheartedly, but we've done it. Yeah. And we'll get back there. We need to get back there yeah. to where our scores are high again. Mm -hmm. So, um, but the other thing um, on that is HCAPS, is HCAPS is for internal inpatient surveys for your star quality rating. Yeah. Um, it is a handwritten survey. It's the way uh, Medicare CMS, they require it to be a handwritten survey. They will not take it electronically. Okay. Now, all other areas can be handwritten, electronic, email, text message. Well, we, all of, we've even tried phone calls in our other facilities. And we try it here, too. It doesn't improve the rate. <coughs> and now, with all the robocalling, they see a 405. And they don't answer. Yeah. It's really a tough thing to get responses of. Yeah, over the years I've been here, I remember in 2008, we had decided that we need to go to phone calls because that would be more personable because nobody wants to fill out a hand survey. So we did that for a number of years, and we got so many complaints on that person was actually rude who called me or or I didn't know that was that number. It was, it's a long survey, too. Yeah, it's a long yes, survey. Right. People would hang up in the middle of the survey. It's, it's, it would, and then, but then we go back to the paper, and everybody then wants to go back to the phone call and thinking it's better. I can tell you over the years, I know that it's, I know that it's no, no, and I know that it's a long survey, but paper is probably your best in my experience. But it is hard to get people to fill it out. So, but we still can do it. Okay. Um, ED, um, we're working on it. But we aren't, we didn't have, we had a dip in the third quarter, and I was really kind of nervous about that, but they've had three consecutive quarters. Actually, this is the second quarter. They're still maintaining, but we've had two consecutive that we haven't had another dip, so I'm proud of them. We still would like to be in the 60s. This is a top box score, and I don't have percentile ranking because we did go to Bivaris. If you remember, Bivaris got bought up by Press Ganey. We hope to have top, um, this is top box. How many people score you a five? 52% of the people scored us a five. Uh, in, some cat in one of the categories, or 52% in all the categories, they scored us a five uh, for a top box score. And so everything else was, so about half, if you will. We'd like to see that number in the 60s. Comparatively, is, is better than you would think. Yes. <laughs> for an ER, if they're not, you know, eight, nine, and ten. Right. <clears throat> but it's still, it's still not where it wants to be. It's just not. Sur surgical services, on the other hand, which we, that's where you have all your specialists going. They're scoring on average, you know, at least in the 60, they're getting like 60, 68 percent of the time. Uh, they're getting a uh, top box score of five in all categories. So that's where you want to see your trend. Um, but I would not compare surgical services to ED. So right. we're looking at, we, I, we have a goal of 60 um, for them. And so that's what they're you, working You just towards. need to get that nurse in the British accent to right. answer every She's question. Wonderful. Answer every Say question. Hi, everyone. She was so nice, you know. She's she made it. She is so wonderful. Yeah, she was an excellent nurse. DJ and her, and we win every day. So, but yes. Yes, I do. So, uh, clinic system, um, I can tell you, uh, Olivia and the team met. Uh, they didn't like their trend. The trend was kind of trending down for both clinic system overall, uh, family practice, specialty, and urgent care has been comparatively down to everyone else almost on a regular basis for every quarter and uh, we have worked towards uh, we've got a fresh new nurse practitioner group in there if you will too and so I'm very excited with where they've gone with urgent care overall um, I know that we had from last quarter we had an improvement also in specialty and it looks like we held our own for family practice uh, but for the clinic system overall, because of everything else, they just edged up a little bit. But see, they're sitting up in the, um, in the overall 62.6, so I'm very pleased with that. I hope that keeps on increasing. And they can dive down in this by provider. So she's talking with her managers and going each manager to meet their goals um, and share it with their physicians. Um, if I can, one time, uh, I just got a call and Dr. Hassan said, what do you mean I'm making a 68% top box rating? We should be in the 90s. Why hasn't anybody shared this with me? So Olivia and their team are sharing that data. And so he even got involved in that and he started looking at it. And 
what do you mean that no one waits here? Everybody goes straight back, and and uh, so we're going to talk to our we're going to talk to our uh, patients as they come through and see how long their wait is. And he, he wants his scores high, but that's what we want. We want people to want their scores to be high to be good to all of our patients, if you will. So they've really gotten some involvement in the urgent care. Once it was shared with them, they started making very proactive changes in there to get patients through in a timely manner. And with that, that ends up. Does anybody have any questions on the patient experience? <clears throat> Those are tough numbers for me. Mm -hmm. yes, they are. We go through the same thing. We can do it. We have a good team. Well, I had two experiences since the last meeting, I think. Everybody was consummate professionals, nice people, and, and they were great. With that, I'm going to bring in the infection control team. No, I'm going to leave, so I'm not breaking rules on the camera. Thank you so much, ma'am. <laughs> Kyle's going to step out too, and then we're going to go ahead and bring them in. I am very, I'm going to talk a little bit about the CEO report, but I'm so proud of this team. I don't think everybody knows what this team has done. Um, we collectively, over the last um, uh, 90 days, so uh, we'd like to inform the board. So if you get asked questions out there and such, and uh, Dr. Profenna. Uh, is going to be in here, little Sue, and uh, uh, Mandy, to give this a little report, if you don't mind. Luke is coming tomorrow. It's his birthday today. Oh. And he's coming tomorrow. Oh. He's been oh. quarantining oh. him because he wants to be in the room. Yeah, yeah. So. What? This is boring. Yeah, we're 10 people. Oh, yeah. Everybody's got a job. Don't breathe on me, man. Good, how are you, John? Yeah, you're the expert in this. You can tell me. Hello, I'm tired. Sorry. Yeah, come on. So your your boys are my old man, Carmen and John. One more story. So where are you working? They're done. District three. So I got every Thursday. But my area is the area. They were already but you're at the doing yes. indoor yeah. so, like they were already there. Yeah. And they were already on the track warming up. Okay. Oh, so they're going to get I'm going to see it as I touched her. I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 The risk is the same. The thing is, they all went to press. So they're not going to be there, and it seems like the community spread now is the driving force. But the ones that I know of, we've had six total that have come out with fever, flu like symptoms, only one with overseas travel. Uh huh. But yeah, it's hard to see in this. And I had to be the guinea pig on the first one to get to, you know, go through the, the procedure. Is that the thing? You want to go up? Just give me a second. I'll give them to you. I just want to do that. All right. And then I'm going to take care of you. There you go, sir. I like that. Okay. All right. More so help. Hey, how are you all? Good. I hope you're staying clean. No fever. No fever. Not congregating into 10 people or more. Anyway, so uh, I'm just going to give a, a few quick slides on kind of the background of the, of the disease and what's going on here in Texas. And then she's going to give what we're doing. Sue's going to give what we're doing. So, so basically, I don't know if you guys have seen this graph. You know, this is the way that... Um, that infectious disease and epidemiologists look at different viruses. Basically, the bottom is the average number of people infected by each sick person. So, for instance, if eat measles, it infects about nine people per person, so it's highly, highly contagious. But only 1% uh, of the people, less than 1% of the people die. So it's highly infectious, but it's low, um, low uh, death rate. So if you look at 
COVID-19. So here's, here's the, the seasonal flu right here. So seasonal flu is about a 0.01% death rate from seasonal flu. So we get a ton of people that are infected by it. Um, even, but only one person is infected uh, for everyone who has it. So it's actually a very low spread, uh, low death toll disease, low case fatality disease. So COVID-19, it depends where you're looking. Like in Italy, the death rate's like up at 10, uh, over 10% right now. But they have an older population and they have a lot of smokers, right? So they have a lot of comorbid disease and it got out of hand really rapidly. A lot of elderly people got it and the death rate's at actually at 10%. I mean, so that's really high. Whereas in South Korea, the death rate is less than 0.9%. Um, they have a much younger population. And plus, we don't really know much about ethnicity and who, who might get very sick and who might not get very sick. So anyway, COVID-19 is here in the middle. It looks like it's infecting somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5 um, people per person. So it's not like everybody who comes in contact with someone with COVID-19 is going to get infected, but a significant amount, more than who are in touch with people with influenza are going to get it. And then the death rate um, overall, you know, uh, is somewhere between uh, 0.7 and 3.4 percent. So we don't know what it's going to be like in the United States. Is the United States more like Italy? Is it more like, um, or is it more like? South Korea, you know, or are we somewhere in the middle? So the next slide. So you hear this, all this stuff about flattening the curve. So I'm just kind of going to explain kind of what that is. So if you don't do anything, and this is, this is like what happened in China, and this is also what's happening in Italy right now, is... <clears throat> Back here, when they started getting their first cases, nobody intervened. So they started passing it, and then by the time they by the time they started intervening, so many people had it that it spreads, goes way up, and this is the line of where your healthcare system is, it, the capacity of healthcare system. So now you get stories out of Italy; they're on this bump, way above their healthcare capacity. So they got no masks, they got no uh, ventilators, they're they have to decide between people. And I just heard today that, um, you know, the, in, in uh, Great Britain, they decided that anybody over 65 would not be put on a ventilator. So that means if you get sick in Great Britain and you're in the national health system, you will not be put on a ventilator. Well, that'll take care of the Social Security problem. So, so anyway, um, so here, like today there were 50, 5,322 new cases in Italy and 427 new deaths. So the, the country's not as big as ours. So that's, that's here. That's still on the upswing. They haven't made it to the peak yet. <clears throat> and that's what happened in Hubei, Hubei, China. And then it started coming down again. And now, they're, now they shut everything down. They put in martial law, essentially. Um, and they stopped it. So we're trying to get to this curve where we're, we're still early in, the, early in the transmission. So we're trying to make all these efforts to cut down transmission so that we know we're going to get more and more cases. We're doing more and more testing, and we know that people had it, and we have local transmission. So we know we're going to get more cases. But we're trying to keep it so the, case, so the cases don't peak above our health system capacity. So that's why, for instance, like, um, you know, the president released uh, ventilators from the stockpile, is releasing some masks slowly. Um, we don't have any, any specific treatment for it other than, other than supportive. So basically you support and then you get through the, get through the disease. Um, so today there were 2,500 new cases in the United States and 26 new deaths. <clears throat> so we're somewhere down here. You know, we're some, somewhere around this number, but we don't know what curve we're on. So that's why, you know, starting, starting midweek last week and this week, everybody started doom and gloom and shutting stuff down. So that's like why DeWine in Ohio, why now we have a state of emergency in Texas, 
shutting down all the bars, shutting down all the transmission so you can't transmit this. Mm -hmm. Because what we want to do, <clears throat> this will stretch it out to two or three, four months. But it'll also not overwhelm our system. So if we need to admit people, we can admit people. So sick patients always within our capabilities. Hospitals not over, overwhelmed and we have enough ventilators. So next slide. I have a quick question real quick. Yeah. So due to Italy's lack of response, yeah. their curve spike. Right. So we can assume that that's always going to be the case, but when did the U.S. have the first reported case outside of the evacuees that came back? Um, Do we know? Uh, it was like a month ago in Washington so State, right? Roughly 30 days. Yeah. Right? And then that 10,442, mm -hmm. what does that number represent? Oh, this is the number of cases we've had so far so in far. the States okay. that have been reported. Right. Right. right, that have been Yeah, tested. so I mean it's... So last week when I was listening to the, to the DHS, I mean the Department of State Health Services, mm -hmm. they have a daily call at 4 o'clock, and they were able to, tr in Texas, we were able to test 147 people a day last Friday, 147. Then by Monday, we were able to test 1,800. Mm -hmm. So now we can test 1,800. We have... You can go to Freeman Coliseum with a, with a slip from your, from your doctor that you need to be tested. And what happens there is a guy from Utusca, either infectious, infectious disease or public health or somebody, will interview the patient and decide whether they should be um, tested or not. But, and they can do 16 tests per hour there. So now we're starting to get, and, and LabCorp and Quest, they all have the ability to do this now. So now we can start to actually get tests. So what's going to happen? We're going to get a huge spike in positives, right? So the more people we test, the more positives we have. That doesn't mean the disease got any worse. It just means that we located it and found it, right? And that's good. Right. It's good. How I mean, accurate are it's, the what, it's what we, huh? How accurate are they? Nobody knows. Um, that, was, that was asked today on this thing, and um, there's no gold standard for the test. So the test is, we think it's pretty accurate. But, I mean, all we could do is compare it to the Chinese or to the, you know, to other tests that have been done in other countries. It's a PCR test, so they chop up the virus, and then it's a, and then they, um, it's a reverse, anyway, they, they, they have little tags that are unique to, um, unique to this virus, and then it replicates, and then they test the DNA that's made from it. So it's a complicated test takes a little while, and we think it's pretty accurate. They think it's pretty accurate. So they think it's as accurate as the current flu the, test, or? The, the state health commissioner, um, doesn't want to say doctor, that. said that's all she knows about it. Okay. And the CDC doesn't know any more about it. So next. <clears throat> and this, um, this is what they taught us in MPH school was that this is the effects of social distancing on the 1918 flu, flu deaths. This is why we do this, is because there was this, in 1918 flu showed up in, uh, in Philadelphia and roughly at the same time it was in St. Louis. St. Louis <coughs> took like a day to say, shut everything down. Philadelphia didn't. And that's what happened in Philadelphia and this is what happened in St. Louis. So that's why all this stuff you hear on the news about social distancing, six feet, coughing, you know, stopping your cough, only going to, you know, not going to bars, not congregating. Um, that's why it's important, and that's where it's been tested before. So, I mean, that's what we kind of get this idea from. Thanks. So, luckily, um, the majority of infections are mild. Uh, only have like about 17% are either severe that need to be um, hospitalized or critical. And this is a weird disease that happens very rapidly from being like nothing to zero to 60 in a very short period of time where you need to go into the hospital. Um, and then those aged 60 or plus are at most risk. So, um, so the death rate I had read, now it says 14.8, but the death rate I had read you know, in, in people <coughs> 80 plus 
my, my mom just turned 80, is 21%. That's what I was quoted before. That, that, her 20, around 20%. Yeah. So, I mean, the older you are, the more, the, the more chance that you're going to die from this. And especially people with comorbid conditions. What about the, the, you know, you hear all this stuff, you know, lots of, lots of information out there and some of it's right. wrong. You know, one of the things we first heard was, you don't have to worry about kids. Kids right. don't get it. Right. Well, kids don't get sick and they don't die. Mm -hmm. But they're pa they can get it and they can pass it around. There are, but it's really a weird disease mm -hmm. because, you know, usually when you get a disease like this, the children, sick children die and sick old people die. You know, but this one, the sick children aren't dying, and nobody has really explained that. I haven't seen any explanation for that. But they can still, that's why closing the schools is big, is because it gets passed around in that group. They're not going to even get that sick, but then they're going to go home and see grandma, you know. She will. And, it's gonna, and she will, you know. So, so they'll be the vectors. They are. Yeah. yeah. Did they shut down the beaches? Yeah, and so the... Intense. They've all been... <clears throat> They've all been congregating for the last two weeks. So. Right. I, I mean, um, you know, like when I was making this, I'm like, boy, you're being pretty. Like all day I've just been like, every, every news bit of information you get, you get more and more depressed that things are going to get out of control really rapidly. So, so you know, and, and it took us a while to get here. But, I mean, when, when they stuff on, you guys are our eyes and ears in the community, right? Because you're going to go back and influence people. So this is what's happening. I mean, if we, if we are able to restrict people as much as possible, then we may be able to blunt it. And the, the other thing is, we won't know at the end of the day whether it was because of that. If we win, you know, some people are going to say it wasn't that bad. Or, or did we do enough to stop it? So it's like, anyway. At the end of the day, it, but but really, it could get bad very rapidly, and they have patients. We're on our third desk in Texas. So next slide. So this, uh, you know, Texas is now a public health disaster as of I think noon today by Governor Abbott. Um, all the bars are shut down. All the restaurants are shut down as of Friday night. That's all new information today. Um, so this is the total number of people who have been tested in Texas, 23, uh, uh, 2,335, 872 by the state labs and 1,463 by the private labs. Um, the total statewide cases is 143. This is off the um, Department of State website. And all these counts that you get, a lot of them are off. So this is, this might be off too you know, because the actual flow of information is slow and mm -hmm. do doesn't work. And then when they, when they turn somebody in who's positive, they might not have filled out the form correctly. Anyway, there's, del there's delays in getting accurate information, but this is the most accurate that we have. So uh, I just calculated how many statewide cases we have that are positive, you know, divided by this. And it came up with about 6% of the tests are, are positive. And then Today, the number of cases was up by 60. So it went from, whatever, 80, 83 up to 143 today. So there were 60 new cases. A question, I, I guess, you know, I hear all the stuff, you know, people want to go get tested. I'm thinking, well, if you get sick, you start feeling crummy, I mean, the doctor really can't do anything for you. Right. They're going to say, go home, take aspirin, get bed rest, drink lots of liquid, but basically like they do with the flu. You know, right. it's a virus. Uh -huh. I mean, we can give you something if it'll make you feel better psychologically, but right. it's going to do anything. You know. the, the, so benefit do, do the benefit of testing is if you don't have it. The benefit of testing is if you don't have it. So if you get it, and I mean you don't get it, you get, you get sick, mm -hmm. and we test you, and in two days we're able to tell you you don't have it, you can go back to work. Mm -hmm. you, you know, where otherwise you're supposed to stay out of work for 14 days. Okay. You know, and then all, your, from all your contacts. Go back right. To well, you know. Yeah. But I just, I just wonder if it isn't really, if you start feeling bad, is it really important to go get tested? Well. Or not? Or should you just say, I mean, well, from, like, for me, as a healthcare yes. provider, hell yeah. I'm going to go get tested if I start getting symptoms because yeah. I want to be negative because, right. you know. So do we know from the time of suspected onset mm -hmm. until the, they show positive tests? Uh, no. 
We don't know that. And so we don't know the time of exposure to the time to but we know signs the, and symptoms either, right? Well, we know uh, it's actually pretty low. It's like four to five days mm -hmm. is the average. Okay. But, you know, it goes, it, it's as long as 14 days. Right. That's why that quarantine you got. Right. But I was just thinking the average of, to, to be, to showing those signs and symptoms. So, I mean, five days, then they, if they test positive, that's a lot to try to contain due to exposure. I know it's, a, it's a, what is it, one in one. No, yeah, one in however many. Yeah, so. Yeah. Okay. What are they contagious? What are you contagious after being exposed? Um, I, I don't know. I don't really know that either. You're you're contagious before you have symptoms, mm -hmm. and you're contagious at least seven days after your last fever. I think I heard today that you were, you shed more. Early in the disease. Early in the disease, yeah. and you do later. So. But I can't say what the day yeah. is. But. So anyway. People will walk around with this disease without knowing it and pass it. So, so basically, how can you, how how can Texans slow the spread of COVID-19? <coughs> Next two weeks are critical in slowing. Texans must act now. Stay home, especially if you're sick, older, or have a medical condition. If you are sick, stay home except to access medical care. If you're able to take care of yourself, stay home. If you need to see your doctor, call ahead. And tell them what you got before you come. Avoid gatherings of more than 10 people and non-essential trips into public. Cancel events of more than 10 people and limit close contact six feet with other people. So, um, and then <clears throat> employers should allow alternative work options. So as many people as we can have that can work from home, um, we should have people working from home, isolated. And I know people who are in charge of other people don't necessarily like that idea, but, um, but the more we can separate people, the better off we are. So that's my, we, we had one, one patient that we swabbed the, here the other day, and basically he didn't enter the clinic. Uh, we went out and swabbed him in the car. So the. So, so we were able to do that and send it off to like yeah. West or something? Mm -hmm. Right, I don't know what lab it went to. Lab core. Lab core. Lab core. So it went to lab. Okay, so we don't have to go to San Antonio to test. No. No, no and, um, yeah, so we're trying to figure out, like, we, we have enough to test people that we need here uh, uh, on campus, but then also um, I was told by another place that uh, LabCorp will actually come and test people too, and then you can also drive to places to get tested. So, but how are we handling doctor visits then? You know, are we, yeah, like well, here, and they took my temperature before. Let's go over there. Okay, you're going to go over there. Perfect. You're going to do that? All right, we'll still start. <laughs> you're first, right? Okay, so we wanted to update y'all on the meetings and committees and changes and everything that we're doing. Um, we started doing, uh, we have a task force committee meeting, that's Dr. Profena, Bob, uh, Sue, and uh, I and Dr. Dunn, uh, the director of the emergency department. We're meeting every morning at 8 o'clock since, uh, you know, all the information is changing daily. So we meet first thing in the morning to figure out what's the latest, what happened overnight, what's going on as far as the CDC, state regulations, our strike, um, and then is there anything we need to implement and disseminate throughout the day. Leadership meetings, we're meeting with the directors every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9 o'clock, the essential people uh, to discuss any <coughs> process changes. I can't change that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, process and daily changes and then that way they can take it and disseminate information to their staff instead of having 30 people here in the room. Uh, Sue is trying to stay up with the daily conference calls so with DSHS every day at what four? Four o'clock. That's a daily call. Mm -hmm. We've canceled all non-essential meetings and uh, we're doing daily updates to employees via the intranet. So they can log in anytime. So we set around 11 or 12 o'clock. Um, it's the latest update on, on what's going on, either here with the CDC, any changes. So any staff member from any computer can log on and, and get that update. And of course, to date, uh, no COVID cases confirmed in Wilson County. So screening. So as you all, all probably saw, we have um, two different screening areas, but one entrance to the hospital. One of the things 
that other, um, like Bob's in some chat groups, I'm in some chat groups with nursing and administrators. And so one of the things that um, a few hospitals got in trouble with is just having one main screener, people staying in line, and there's an emergent patient in there, so you can actually get, you know, have an EMTALA violation, right? So we went ahead and set up that we have a main screening for your normal outpatient process, uh, people coming to get a lab, x-ray, uh, surgery, and then we have an ER screener. So if somebody's needing to come in, they can quickly get to the ER if there's something going on and, and not be delayed emergency care. Um, the main entrance, uh, screening all outpatient services and visitors. There's one visitor per patient unless it's a minor and uh, anyone that has like, you know, legal guardian care or somebody that's coming in that, that needs an, an adult to help them. Visitors receive a wristband for that day and it will be cut off when they leave. They will have a temp check. The temp must be less than 99.6 as well as the normal CDC recommended questionnaire, yeah, the travel history. So the side entrance is locked? The side entrance is shut down, yeah. Okay, and employees know not to let anybody in when they go out? I can't say that. No that tailgating? Doesn't. They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to, we let them know, but I can't say that that hasn't ever happened, but we're always looking at ways to improve that. Well, is that a termination sentence? Well, I mean, that just happened like hey, yesterday, it is a, right? It is a, well, Two days ago? Yeah. Or no, so yesterday. Like somebody <laughs> tailgating with you? Yeah. You can Still be terminated. Um, so, as I said, the Even ER, um, separate screener to ensure uh, no EMTALA concerns. Same thing, one visitor per patient. They must stay in the ER with the patient, no coming in and out. Of course, make exceptions. Uh, if it's a minor, both parents can be back there with them. If there's a, a minor and another parent has other siblings with them, then we'll ask that parents take the kids and go outside uh, to limit. And they're also getting the same temp check as well as CDC for uh, recommended screening questionnaire. Um, we are working very closely with, with um, Brandon and Bob, Dr. Nunn, to try to put out a screening out front, a 10 out front, so that's, to come, we're looking at the logistics of that and the medical screenings outside for anybody who has respiratory issues. So they wouldn't even come into the hospital. Everything else would still be filtered as normal through the emergency room except anybody who has respiratory issues. That will help us largely conserve PPE in the ER <coughs> as well. Next, I think that's, yeah, that's yours. Okay. So real quick, man, yes. I want to say Saturday night? I'm sorry, morning, whatever it was. The, the staff did well. They had a plan in place, and it was easy to navigate. Good. When we came in and, and left. Okay. So, Great. Good job. Perfect. So a lot of the process changes have to do with social distancing, and everybody's heard that buzzword of social distancing. You may notice what I have here. It's a little uh, communication system. It's called Mosera. We got a grant. Uh, and so we have about 25 of these. And what we've done, this is the first time we've used them, but it works perfectly for all the screening and the process that's happening right now, is we're just able to click the button and say, call Mandy Shrala. And then she has one on as well. And if I need something, if I'm upstairs, we have somebody has a 